Hello, my name is Jean Lampire, and I teach the history of science in antiquity at UCL. This week, together with three of my colleagues, we'll introduce you to the fascinating world of heavenly cycles. We'll also introduce you to some beliefs that these cycles have produced in humankind. We'll be dealing with a number of these cycles, some of them extremely long and others fairly short. In this video and in the next one, I'll focus on the particularly rich topic of eclipses. Eclipses, both solar and lunar, have always been considered to be a fascinating phenomenon. In the past, this fascination was frequently mixed with a certain feeling of anxiety, if not of petrifying fear. Even today, and although their occurrence can be calculated with great accuracy, eclipses still fascinate. During a total eclipse of the sun, birds stop singing, the world turns dark, and temperatures drop. Clearly, the phenomenon has lost none of its interest, even when it can be observed by millions of people around the world. What I propose to do in this unit is to look at various ideas about eclipses as they circulated in the ancient world. These ideas generally fall into two categories. On the one hand, we have genuinely scientific attempts to explain the phenomenon in a rational way. On the other, we have what can best be defined as sheer superstition. I'll begin with the latter category, which is definitely the most fun. In the next unit, we'll look at some rational and scientific explanations. In the ancient and medieval worlds, eclipses generated many widespread superstitions. It was generally believed that the disappearance of the moon or the sun was caused by the interfering presence of an opaque body in the sky or the cause was thought to be the, the intervention of a demon or a genius threatening the sun or moon that required specific rites or magical formulas to be driven off. As you can see, we are not quite done with the demons of the other week yet. In ancient Rome, for instance, it was common practice to bring back the overshadowed images of the sun or the moon by shouting or playing trumpets or other noisy instruments or by lighting torches in the direction of the missing luminary. This tradition goes back to very ancient Roman practices. In various societies of Europe and Asia, the demon capturing the sun or the moon was usually a dragon. In Indian cosmogonic traditions, as reported in the Mahabharata, a famous Indian epic poem written in Sanskrit, this demon is called Rahu. Rahu develops a fierce hatred toward the sun and moon and wants to devour them both. His head is named Rahu, while his tail is named Ketu. Rahu is represented as a huge head on a smaller chest to by a body ending in a, a repti reptile tail. Later on, Rahu and Ketu were said to correspond to the two ecliptic nodes, that is the two points of intersection between the ecliptic and the lunar orbit. The close position of the Sun and Moon to these ecliptic nodes is a necessary condition for eclipses. With the expansion of Buddhism, this belief in the demon Rahu and Ketu spread more widely. It was even incorporated into Chinese astrology, under the names Luo Wu and Jidu in modern Chinese. In the Indian tradition, Rahu and Ketu are also regarded as authentic planets. In Syriac literature, we find manuscripts that refer to a belief that eclipses occur because a celestial dragon or snake stands up between the sun and the moon, with its head or tail 
overshadowing one of the two luminaries. This belief was still widely held in the 7th century CE. In these traditions, this celestial monster is often called Atalia. This dragon of eclipses may have derived from the development of a cosmologic idea from late antiquity relating to the Ouroboros, or tail-biting serpent. The Ouroboros is a symbol already found in ancient Egypt and in Mesopotamia. It represents a snake surrounding the orderly and perceptible world and separating it from chaos. The name head and tail, which is used for the ecliptic nodes, may also be found in other ancient cultures, even if the actual belief in the dragon had long disappeared. The Muslim astronomer Al-Biruni, as well as Byzantine astrologers and astronomers from the same period, still refer to the ecliptic nodes simply as head and tail. In the middle of the 14th century, the Greek astronomer George Chrysokokes states that the ecliptic nodes are called head and tail by the Persians. In other Greek astrological or cosmological texts, the dragon gave way to a dark star. But it is still called head and tail and it still overshadows the sun and the moon. In the Latin West, it was not until the reception of Arab and Greek texts that the expression dragon's head and tail, caput and coda draconis, was used. This is the case in the astrological corpus of the Alcandriana in the 10th century or in the work of the astronomer John of Sacrobosco in the 13th century. Just as with the appearance of a comet in the sky, eclipses have generally been regarded as phenomena announcing an adverse event, the death of a king, a war or a defeat, a famine, an epidemic, infertility of the soil of, or of animals, and so on. Political and military events are also reported to have been influenced by eclipses. For instance, it is reported that on the eve of the Battle of Arbeles in 331 BCE, Alexander the Great had to calm his own troops who had panicked during a lunar eclipse. So, what we have seen so far are examples of the way eclipses were interpreted in Greece, ancient Rome, India and China, as well as in some Muslim territories. To discover some rational explanations of the same phenomena, let's move on to this week's second video.